History can seem very abstract at times, but in reality, it's very real. So World War II is an important part of our living history. This is history that is so important to our country, reshaped our country, reshaped the world. It's a history that uh, can make us understand some of the problems and challenges we have today. And it's a history that can honor a generation of Americans, among the greatest generation that ever uh, was a part of a fabric of our country. America would never be the same. And not to understand the history of World War II and its legacy is not to understand America today. We could feel what was coming uh, and we knew very well uh, that for us, uh, part of our life was going to be told to us as to what we were going to do. I knew we, we were probably going to go to Europe uh, at some date because uh, the Germans were right on the coast of France and right across the channel from England. I arrived at my first prisoner of war camp on my 19th birthday, which was December 18th. I didn't go in until about, till I turned seven, just before 17. In other words, I was still a little young. I was 21 years old when I was flying off the Yorktown. I turned 22 while I was there, but when I look at somebody 21, I think they're pretty young. I didn't feel that way when I was 21. Many of us can remember 9-11. There's another date in our history, December 7th, 1941. Everything changed. One person that can give us his own personal living history of what happened had a front row seat. That was Frank Conley of Quincy, who was there as the bombs landed, who witnessed history in a means that will indelibly be placed in his mind. As he shares that with us, it will remain in our minds. I enlisted in the Navy in 1940 because uh, I was getting 31 cents an hour slaving in the first national grocery store. And there wasn't any future there, so I joined the Navy. A after a big stint in Manila and South China Sea, they sent us back to Pearl Harbor to get the radar. Then December 7th, myself and another guy, we, we had an appointment with two nurses from the Queen's Hospital. And we were all set to go up to Hawaii and celebrate. About five minutes of eight, this big fleet of planes came in, and we thought they were ours until they got closer and then I, we knew they were Japanese when you see the red ball on the side of them. So I said to the OD, I was standing on the quarter deck, I said to him, no more liberty, those are Japanese planes. The first torpedo planes that dropped their torpedoes, they were coming in the stern of our ship and dropping them. They dove down to the right. They came in like this and they dropped them about where our ship was. And they went straight across Hawaii sea frontier to the battleships and they started exploding. It's about the fourth or fifth one. I said to the officer of the deck, I says, this is war for Christ's sake, they're blowing the place up. And he says, battle station. So they rang the bells and that was the beginning of World War II. So then we realized how many planes there were. There was a slew of them. Some of them were going across with smoke coming out of them. Some of them were going across shaky and weaving. And those are the ones that were diving into the uh, foundations of Hickam Field because everything was within a couple of miles of each other. So even if the plane got hit, they'd pick out a target and steer for it. Then we got underway. About 10.30 in the morning, they got steam up so that they could move the ship. We backed up halfway in the channel 
the battleship Nevada was coming up at us, so we had to stop and let them by. We passed the, the uh, Arizona and it was burning like a torch. And the heat was so intense that I had to wet down the ammunition lockers on deck so they wouldn't explode. Oklahoma rolled over and they trapped a lot of people. The battleship Nevada was going out. It got hit with three torpedoes in the bow. It started to sink, bow first. So they gave it all ahead full and left rudder and buried it in the mud. But Two seconds later, I was on the uh, rangefinder watching what was going on up ahead. And I saw three torpedo wigs coming at, right at us. I go, uh-oh. So I hollered on the phone, torpedo dead ahead. And one of them went by us on the port side, and the other two hit a reef and exploded. So we were lucky. They formed a combination of the ships that survived, two or three destroyers, Heavy cruiser in, in the St. Louis, and, and we went out and looked to spot, see if we could spot the Japanese fleet, contact them, you know, and we figured that we followed the planes, but the planes disappeared so fast that we lost track of, you know, with what direction to go and everything. Never did find them. Three days later, we came in. The first thing we saw was all the battleships. The Oklahoma rolled over. They were cutting holes in the bottom to get the, some of the men out. And they assigned me, assigned a lot of us to, to uh, row the whale boats, picking up bodies. It was you know, three or four days afterwards. Another important day in U.S. history was June 6th, 1944, D-Day. So much was at stake, and the mobilization was unparalleled. Part of that effort went to a very elite group of people, the U.S. Rangers. Tom Ruggiero of Plymouth was one of those Rangers. They were given the task of climbing the rock cliffs to try and knock out the enemy guns. Of the 10 million people uh, that served in World War II, only 3,000 of them were U.S. Rangers. Uh, Tom's story uh, is a riveting story uh, of one of the greatest battles in our United States history. Yeah, the way we got picked was uh, there was a couple, three, three or four guys from the first Ranger Battalion, asking the guys questions. He says, uh, gee, he says, you're not very big, are you? I said, how, how big do you have to be to squeeze a trigger on a rifle? The night before D-Day, this uh, executive officer that we had was drinking. He, he was demoralizing the guys. He said, this is stupid. We're all going to get killed trying to get up those cliffs. Word got the rudder. Rudder said, you are in show business. Get your cronies to get these guys laughing again. And we got the guys all laughing. This was the night before. And that, that brought them back. i never forget the officer on the mothership made a speech to us. You're on one of the best landing craft there is. If your boat gets hit or flips over or whatever, don't leave the boat. It won't sink. Mm -hmm. When I come down that rope ladder to get in the boat, I said, dear Lord, don't let me drown. I want to get in there and do what I'm supposed to do. He didn't let me drown. We got within uh, I'd say 600, 700 yards. A duel started with one of the destroyer and the German guns, and the stuff was coming in on us. Uh, I saw one guy, the concussion killed him. We got within 400 yards of it. Uh, one round hit the front, didn't hit the boat. It just bow went up, and when the bow went over, emptied us all in the water. We were in the water for two and a half hours, 42 degrees. The first thing I thought of was keep those legs going. One guy that was fairly close to me says, you can't, I can't keep my legs going. Keep them going because if you don't, you're not gonna last. Pretty soon a duel starts with a destroyer and Germans firing. There were short rounds coming in right amongst us in the water. And they, they could see us from the destroyer, but they couldn't do a damn thing for us. What happened was this small Navy gunboat went to Utah Beach and they told, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be over Omaha Beach. 
Thank God for that, because he had to come by us. We saw the gunboat coming towards us. All right, keep it going. Keep it those lights going. They'll pick us up. They threw him a life belt. He got his arm in it. They got him up on deck. He's dead. They threw a monkey fist at me, and I grabbed it. The minute the air hit me, down I went. You know, but they, that, they finally got me with a pike pole. Then they put us on the battleship Texas. The doctor looked at every one of them. He says, you're not sending these guys back in. We wanted to go. One of the living histories that uh, little has been really uh, documented uh, has been the fate of our prisoner of war veterans. Uh, one of these people, Bob Noble in Quincy, was still a teenager when he was captured and held as a prisoner of war uh, by the Germans. His fate was unknown to his family, his loved ones, even to himself as he awaited uh, to find out what fate and what direction the war took and what direction his life would take. Bob was a person who lived through that. He's a person whose personal history remains part of our living history. And I was assigned to the uh, 347th Infantry Regiment of the 87th Infantry Division. We went them by truck and by foot, and we were in the, in the Siegfried Line, and we were under fire by German 88s. It pinned us down for several hours. The morning of the 16th, we attacked uh, from one hill across the valley. We uh, dug in that night in split trenches in the center of this forest. And uh, at that point, uh, things changed. Uh, we, I woke up in the middle of the night and we heard voices speaking in German. We saw a group of men standing and some other men with flashlights. And I was about to fire on them when I didn't like the, didn't like the look of it and I decided not to fire. My assistant BAA man, he says, I'm out of here and he took off for the rear. With that, there were a lot of tracer bullets that were fired at him and I decided that was not the right thing to do. So I hid myself in this slit trench, and I was there probably 15 minutes. It seemed like an hour. Subsequently, a, a German soldier came. He had a flashlight, showed the flashlight in the uh, slit trench, and there I was when I became a prisoner. I joined the group that I fortunately decided not to fire on. Members of my own company, who included the, the, uh, the first sergeant and a couple of other uh, platoon sergeants. They took us off the hill into a town before dawn, uh, they marched us out of the camp under artillery fire. At the end of the next day, the 18th, which was my 19th birthday, we arrived at the first uh, transit camp. We got our first taste of POW rations, which weren't too bad at the time. Uh, we had soup, uh, barley water, and some uh, brown bread. Uh, we had uh, four men on a fairly large piece of, piece of bread, and we were moved by boxcar. Problem uh, with the boxcar is I was one of the first groups in the line they just shoved everybody in the boxcar and they filled up the boxcar and we were in the boxcar for uh, four days and three nights. We got out once, they gave us some dry rations and unfortunately because we all couldn't sit down at the same time, uh, there was a lot of problems with the guys. It was a, it was a real difficult transport. We moved to Stuttgart from there to uh, Falling Boss. I was there until the end of the war. There were probably about two to three hundred Americans, about six hundred British and uh, 7,000 French and over 30,000 Russians. So there were two of us in a bunk. It was wooden slats, no mattress, uh, which really was a good thing because dry mattresses harbored lice and this would have made it that much worse, although we were loaded with lice in any case. At that point, we were on about eight men on a loaf of bread. I was liberated by the British. Uh, I, we, they kept us in the camp for about five days which was kind of difficult because all we were eating was bully beef with canned beef, which was awful. Canadian Air Force flew us out on, and we were returned to Army control in uh, Oxford, England. One of the things least chronicled in war is the response of women in the United States to this national calling. They responded in so many ways. Some enlisted, some became nurses and enlisted. Those left at home performed jobs that women had never performed before in our country. 
Many of them called them Rosie the Riveters. Women were shown the opportunities that they hadn't before, and they performed them well. The role of women in World War II is another area that's not well chronicled. We're fortunate to have in our own district uh, a person who answered that call. Alba Thompson can share that personal history, that amazing story uh, of a woman answering the call in World War II. She raised to the highest level, actually joining the staff of General MacArthur. My sister wants to join the wax. What do you think of that? <laughs> She's crazy. What the devil does a woman want to be a soldier for? Just a waste of time. I was single, I was healthy, I was educated, and I was needed. It was all competitive at that point for women. They'd never had uh, women, especially enlisted women, in the armed forces. They'd had nurses, but they had never had enlisted women or, or uh, women in other uh, capacities because this was officer candidate school. There were no officers. We were trained entirely by men. We got excellent training in Fort Des Moines, Iowa. Most of us made it. Uh, and were commissioned. They called us third officers because at that point it was not at all clear in the minds of, uh, of other military men as to what, we, what they were going to do with these women. So they called us third officers in absence of calling us second lieutenants. But that didn't last very long either. Uh, and we soon became second lieutenants. And, I was assigned to Lorenberg Maxton Army Air Base. My specific job, I was to stage units for overseas. It was really exciting and sad. I staged some of the finest units we ever had in the European theater, but there were such terrible casualties that came back. I got to transferred into the Army Air Corps. I was going off to this special school, you see, which I really did not understand. What it really was, preparation for the invasion of Japan. So we were to study language, economics, social studies of all kinds, government, all the army material plus all the skills that we were going to need to run the Japanese government. Because I was Air Force, uh, I had to go for my orders to that particular headquarters, and they immediately sent me to General MacArthur. Well, the, you, know, you don't question your orders, you go. So I don't know why I was selected to the General MacArthur's staff. But if you know General MacArthur, he was a man with his own sense of history, and you may tell him whatever you liked, but in the last analysis, he was going to use his own training and make the best uh, decision which might not always be to the liking of other people. And he did. He was magnificent in the occupation of Japan and of Korea, where I also served the, the general. Somewhere along the line, you probably will ask me, did it make any difference that you were a woman? The answer is you never recognized that I was a woman. You did what you had to do, and it didn't matter what gender you were. You were expected to be superior. George Raymond of Barnstable was aboard the USS Milwaukee with no intercoms, no way of communications. Yet his role was uh, communications uh, in the USS Milwaukee. And as hard as it is to believe in, in these days of iPhones and iPads and instantaneous communication, what was prevalent during the Civil War was being utilized during this portion of World War II as well. George Raymond communicated with the bugle. I enlisted three days before Pearl Harbor, and I was taken into the service on the 12th of December, 1941. Thought I would join the Navy and, and uh, not to see the world, but to be a musician, and I wanted to go to the Navy School of Music. I was in the South Pacific the early January. I only had about two or three weeks of boot camp. Didn't learn a thing. It was a light cruiser, but it was born the same year I was born, 1922. So it was a pretty old ship even in 1940. We didn't have any intercom aboard our ship. Everything was done by the bosun's pipe or the bugler. So 
I would have to, if I had to sound a particular call, I'd have to run to three hatches and let the crew know what was going on. In the Pacific, there was no continent to conquer. It was the vast oceans of the Pacific and the islands that not only were oases in the past, but became actual battlegrounds during World War II. Mickey Lally and Al Messina, both of Plymouth, have never met each other. Yet, at this important time of history, ironically, uh, they shared that important part of the U.S. history together. Both of them on the same fleet, one on the USS Missouri, the other on the USS Yorktown. This is their personal history. I couldn't get in the, the Navy uh, in the beginning because you had to have a degree. So then they had to open it up if you could pass the test. So I took the test and passed the test. I was called and I went down to Wesleyan University for four months. I was just uh, all academic. There was no flying. I went from there to Fitchburg State Teachers College. We used, flew out of Fitchburg Airport. I went to Melbourne, Florida to fighter school. And that's where I became a fighter pilot. Went to New York and uh, Missouri had just been newly painted, ready for the crew, and we commissioned it. And it was assigned to the Yorktown, February of 45. I was on the Yorktown about five and a half, almost six months. We dropped 500 pound bombs. We fired five inch rockets. And of course we had the 650 caliber machine guns that we strafed. Could do a lot of damage. Like I said, was what the, we were there for. You never get used to it. We were up at 22,000 feet. I noticed oil pouring out of the side of the engine. And I came down through the clouds, and there right in front of me was a brand new fighter, the Peter, all yellow with a red meatball, and it was in front of me. Thank God he was in front of me. If he was behind me, I'd be the guy that would be getting shot at. So I opened up on him, and I hit him right in the cockpit, and he pulled up from the reaction, I guess, of being killed. He pulled back on the stick, and he went straight up through the clouds. So I went off to the left a little bit, and up through the clouds to see if I could find him. And I never saw him again. Uh, that was quite a day. I, I finally made it back by myself, kept looking over my shoulder, see if somebody was chasing me. pre dawn launches were tough because we couldn't put our running lights on until they were up at 5,000 feet. So a lot of mid-air crashes, not just necessarily in my ship, but in all the carriers. They had accidents, accidents on the, on the deck, because there's no lights. They were, they, were, they were hitting us pretty hard, the, the suicide pilots. So this was a raid on the suicide pilot fields. It was pre-dawn and we got there just as the sun was coming up and we were coming from the east to the west. So we, we had to see us and we were 50 feet off the water and we caught them at roll call. I think we killed almost all of them that were out there at, at roll call. That sounds terrible, but, but they were really kicking the, the hell out of us to either kill or, or be killed. I got the Distinguished Flying Cross. It wasn't once one thing, it was uh, everything. Kaiushu and all the islands south of it, uh, and north of Okinawa, and of course Okinawa. At Iwo Jima we were firing right uh before the Marines get out of their Higgins boats, we were firing over their heads, digging holes to make dents so they can jump in there. A lot of them didn't make it on Iwo Jima. You know, they had murderous fire. But we fired for 58 minutes at Iwo Jima. Went right down the line. The Duke of York, the Iowa, Charles and the Missouri. I was flying over the battleships and they were bombing the uh, uh, before the boys, uh, the landing craft went in. We were up probably 2,000 feet anyways. It would rock you, the concussion of that battleship. They go 20 miles, them shells. I mean, uh, and they were about that big. They don't shoot the nine of them up at once. Uh, they'll split the ship in half. The transformation that embodied World War II not only surrounded our movement to an international realm, it also was the mark of a new generation, one that would stay with us for four decades after World War II, the nuclear era. It 
we found out they were going to drop the atomic bomb. So they told us to stay 60 miles away from Japan because this was the task force that was going up bombing every day. They told us to stay away, that they were going to drop a... Everybody had their own version. This day, the dope sheep read, put on you. We used to have these long sleeves, and then we had the things over. And we all thought it was a big joke, but it was just in case any radiation. I was on a, I was on a minesweeper in Okinawa. As soon as they surrendered, they sent the minesweepers right in so the army could occupy. And we started just south of Tokyo, and we started sweeping all the inland sea. And when we got to Hiroshima, we went offshore one day when we got through minesweeping. There was a jeep on the pier. Myself and another guy get in, and we took a ride around Hiroshima to see what it looked like. And I was in a uh, Marine camp for lunch. The lieutenant across from me said, Ma'am, have you been off of the runway to see what lies beyond? And there was something in his voice. And I ran down the runway, and lo and behold, I was looking into Hiroshima. You wouldn't believe it. There was no houses. And everything was wiped out. Anything metal was still there. But everything else, the heat burned it right off. Here and there, there was a building that had not been destroyed, but it was like looking at a tomb. And where I stood, even though I was five miles from epicenter, the ground was broken like the waves that come into Plymouth Harbor and break the mud into pieces. No birds sang, nothing moved, and I felt as though the end of the world had come, and I was the last person living. We recounted the Sunday, December 7th, 1941. There was another Sunday, September 2nd, 1945. The signing on the USS Missouri is one that culminates that war because of the surrender of Japan. And we have the account of another personal witness, Al Messina of Plymouth, who was there on the USS Missouri to chronicle the closing, officially, of World War II. Well, we, uh, we knew all the big shots were going to come aboard. Nimitz, Machata, Secretary Knox, Halsey. And every time one of them would come aboard, they'd blow the whistle, yes salute and stop what you were doing. So finally there was so many dignitaries, they said we wouldn't have to salute. Everybody filled up the guns. So I'm up, I'm up on Terror 2 looking down. When they announced their surrender and everybody started climbing up high, getting a view, you know. We didn't think that much of it, but it was a big deal. And the history that surrounds World War II in that era lives with us today. Sadly, we're losing so many people of that great, great generation each day. This is an effort to try and make sure that their story, their personal story, the story of America during that era is preserved. <laughs>